Hey all, I'm Paul Reese, an engineer with the developer relations team on Google ML. And I'm Lance Carr. I worked on Project Game Face and AI enthusiast. Awesome. So the last couple of videos, we worked a little bit more on the implementation side of ML, how you would actually add that to your computer right. and work through object detection and face gesture recognition. For this video, we kind of wanted to just have a light conversation, just to kind of give people an idea of what you can even do with on-device machine learning, just to make cool things and kind of get them started. Right. It's just amazing how we can use this AI to do jobs that we didn't know needed done. Right. So I, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So yeah, I mean, just to kind of start off some of the ideas. So one of the things that I've always liked is toys, which I think we can all see you do toys. too. Toys. <laughs> Love and toys. Awesome. So educational toys with AI is kind of one of those areas that I've always appreciated. So um, let's say you take a toy that has a speaker on it. You can say, hey, I'm going to speak to it in English and it'll respond back to me in Spanish to kind of help kids with learning additional languages as they're going along. Right. And then as I grew up and I couldn't move then either, I would always get the most expensive toy possible, like a, a, a chemistry set. Say. <laughs> and then I would sit there and look at the chemistry set or the remote control car. So now we're living in an era where a kid growing up, or I know I'll get them as well, where the toys can be actually used by the person instead of just something to look at. Right. So this is amazing to me. Oh yeah, yep. So I mean, one of the cool things about that too, going back to that same idea is, you can create a lot of touchless systems like we've kind of talked about with Game Face or some right. of these other systems. So the fact that you don't have to have that kind of same wide array of mobility to be able to use things and enjoy them is kind of really awesome, at least from my perspective, so. It, it is, it's the inclusion's incredible now. Awesome. At least the potential if everybody utilizes these tools and does what they can. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, especially once you start getting into like the IoT space too, just because it doesn't need to be on a mobile phone. You can have a Raspberry Pi or something else to actually interact with that can work with motors and sensors and all kinds of other stuff to expand out rather than just Oh, it's on my phone. Awesome. <laughs> right, right, right. It can actually be a physical thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, one of the jobs that I was doing, basically as I was in college, was working in produce inspection. So one of the things that you're doing with that is you're basically looking at these grapes, um, table grapes that we were getting out of Central California, and saying, hey, based off of this color, the size of it, the shape of it, all of these other properties, is it an A grade, B grade, C grade? And that's how you would decide hey, who are we selling this to? Where are we shipping it to across the country or just locally? Or is it going to be canned? That sort of deal. So now you can do that with image classification where you have a model that's already trained for these different produce pieces. You can just snap a picture and say, hey, this looks like it's a B grade. We'll go ahead and just process it here at this packing shed and that sort of deal. See, that's a good idea because I can see myself being in a bad mood someday and just let some C's through <laughs> because, you know, hey, somebody deserves some C's in their life. So <laughs> that's just me. I'm better like that, but... <laughs> yeah, but it's nice to have a standard that you can count on. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, that was one of the things we ran into, too, is since it was so subjective, you have people that have been doing this for 15 years, and they're like, well, this A-grade thing has to be this, but somebody might look at B and be like, yeah, that's close enough. Throw it in there. Right. We're going to sell it to the most expensive restaurant in New York. You know? Right, right, right. It, it, people's uh, judgment can change day to day, like I just said, based on mood, based on anything. Mm-hmm or what they're exposed to prior to getting to the job. So this is great. Yeah. Very good way to standardize. And then what else could we work with? Audio classification. So say, hey, you have a hobby of checking out birds and seeing like which ones they are. If you want to be able to classify them based off of the sounds that you're getting, that's always cool. Another thing is I actually recently made a toy where if it heard a cow, it would light up the little cow icon. So if you're nice. just mooing at it, you know, you see it like light up and- Which everybody moves at a cow. Oh yeah. That's what you do. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Well, especially when you have little kids, you go through these books and you're like, oh, well, Mr. Brown says moo. And then like they repeat it back right. and you can kind of see what that all is, so. Out here fun. we have coyotes a lot. Yep. So I wonder if we could determine the difference between a dog and a coyote. They're definitely distinct. They're definitely distinct. Um, I that think if you had enough data. So actually, going back to the coyote idea, I have chickens um, okay. also out here in Colorado. One of the things that you kind of learn with chickens is that everything that's out there wants to eat them. So True. coyotes, they raccoons, taste like chicken. They taste yeah. like chicken. Yeah. <laughs> so by being able to do that kind of classification, either through vision or whatever, you can actually know if something is coming around, if you need to go reinforce your coop, all of that kind of fun stuff. So Nice. Yeah. So Paul, if you're learning to write a new language or just get better at writing, uh, can this help with that? 
Yeah, definitely. So one of the examples that we have is actually focused more on like digital numbers, but you can take the same exact idea with uh, classification and basically say, hey, I've trained this on 80 characters. I've given them each 100 just handwritten examples of it. You can then use that to kind of look at what you're writing, look at each individual character and say, oh yeah, you do, drew the one for tea rather than water or what have you, just to make sure that you're a little bit more accurate, especially as some of the characters in other languages start to kind of look very similar to, based off of different components that are used to build up those characters. So definitely gotcha. something else you can do there. So now that we're on languages, I saw that we also have been working on uh, recognition of sign language. Yep. Yeah, so what's cool about that one is we already kind of saw that you can get landmarks on a hand or on a face. So if you put those together, you're actually able to track those points over a series of time just by basically recording it and saying, hey, I've got three seconds of video. Here are all these points in each of these frames and they run through a chain. If you look at that, you can run it through another model that can then say, hey, if you have your hand like this and you're going like that, that would be donkey. So it's able to say like with that motion over this amount of time, that's probably the most likely thing. What's cool about that though is you actually have very similar signs that you can do. So like cow, very similar, but it's able to tell the difference just because of where these three fingers are in comparison. Okay. So yeah, you can do that. You can do some with static gestures, which we already saw with uh, just gestures in general. So if we wanted to take thumbs up, thumbs down and turn it into a rock, paper, scissors game, we can do that with just static gestures. Now I used to play rock, paper, scissors with the kids, but it was like, this was scissors <laughs> and this is rock. So now we can actually play it. That'd be interesting. Yep. Um, now, on, I, I noticed on sign language that there's a lot of emoting going on. Is that going to be something it can pick up through, or is it just looking at the hands? So it's actually looking at what your face is doing as well as your hands. Okay. So it's taking both of those series of models and putting them together to collect those points. And this isn't, it sounds massively complicated, but with the tools you created or that, that have been created, it seems like it's just a process of layering one recognition on top of another yep. until you get where you want to be. Essentially, yeah. So because it's already using a series of models, if you're coming in from the kind of same background that I have, or I have no idea how to really train a good model, you can still come in and say, hey, this model exists and this model exists. Let me just go ahead and pipe them together, get this end result, and then move on to whatever the next feature is that I need to make. So again, on language, we were there's a different kind of cryptic language used on uh, license plates. Would there be a way to say fashion license plates that say what you want or say check license plates to make sure they're not too risque for the public? Yeah, so we actually have a tool called text embedding, which is going to basically look at text, look at what it's already been trained for on this model and say like, oh hey, this is kind of similar. So if you had an app where you're saying, hey, let me type in whatever license plate I want, compare it to whatever our like flagged word list is and be like, oh, it's low, medium, or high risk that a person's going to look at this and be like, no, you probably can't use that. Gotcha. Interpret it in the worst way possible. Always go for the worst way possible. <laughs> As intended. <laughs> like I was telling you, I came up with the idea for Game Face by the little apps that give you a dog face or a kitten face. And from that, I've also wondered, people with like uh, Asperger's syndrome or whatever they would like to call it, uh, they can't recognize uh, happiness or sadness. Is there a way to tell the emotion of a face? Very roughly, kind of an approximation, but because you can kind of get the confidence scores on smiles and where your eyebrows are and some of these other things, if you essentially take some of those properties and say, well, these are the most likely things to correlate to a smile or frown or what have you, then you could probably run with it that way just to give a rough approximation of whatever emotion might be likely. Right, but if you're not good at that, if you're, in, in, in fact, at, at a detriment at that, getting any kind of percentile feedback would really help. Yeah, I mean, just be able to have any kind of feedback whatsoever just to be able to base it off of, just to be like, right. well, they were smiling. I mean, they were mad or happy or whatever, just to, right. to be able to kind of refine it a little bit. Well, thank you for your time, Lance. We've talked about a ton of great examples, a lot of things to inspire developers, and just really exciting things. I appreciate it. We, it. It's an exciting field. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. We're looking forward to seeing all the really cool things you make, so be sure to share them with us on YouTube or social media, and we will talk to you all later.